and your blessing. Uh, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 12. You know, oh, pardon me, 2, Romans chapter 2. We've been talking about redemption. And we've been talking about how God has redeemed you to be his child. Uh, last week, we shared about the prodigal son. And, and I hope you got that, what, what God was trying to show us, that when the prodigal son came back, the father was so elated that he came back that he restored everything that that son squandered and blew uh, you know, blue away. You know, the thing is, is God wants you to be His child. You know, we read that verse, I believe, in Rome in uh, in Psalms chapter eight, the prophetic verse of when David was seeing in the spirit in the past. You know, in the spirit realm, you could see past, present, and future. And so David was in the spirit because of praising and worshiping, and he saw in the past where the angels were looking at God's creation of man, and they're saying, "Wow, what is man?" That God is so mindful. What is it where mindful means full in your mind? God is thinking about you. You know, there's a passage in the Bible that says that the thoughts of God are innumerable. They cannot be counted as the hairs on your head. Listen, pardon me, God can count the hairs on your head, but you can't. And so again, God wants you to realize he's got you on his mind. And the Bible says that his thoughts are good thoughts. His plans are good plans. And so uh, the prodigal son, he went off, blew all that he had, and but the whole time his father just wanted him back. Yes, uh, it, it was bad that he was blowing all that stuff, but the father was just concerned about getting his son back. And, and then when the son came back, and the Bible says he came to his senses, uh, he said, I'm just going to go to my dad and say, Father, I'm not worthy to be one of your children. Uh, I'll just be one of your servants. I know I'll eat better and have a better roof over my head. But as he went back, the Bible says the dad saw him from a distance because the dad is looking. He's looking for you every day to come and spend time with him, not just, hey, thank you for saving me, Lord. I'm going to do my own business now. I'll see you later. That's not why he saved you. He saved us for fellowship. He were born again so that we can be one. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says, he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Kind of like uh, the marriage. Uh, marriage is not a contract, it's a covenant. And covenant marriage between a man and a woman, the Bible says the two shall become one flesh. That word flesh has the understanding of one way of thinking and living. And so as, as that outside picture of union is two become one flesh, well, the, out, the inward, uh, that's a good understanding of how the inward should be union. Okay, so anyway, so that prodigal son, the dad, just wanted his son back. He wanted his son to live, love on. And just like God, when, when David saw in the past, when God created a man, what is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man that you visit him. You made him a little lower than the angels, uh, or actually it says, the King James says angels, but the word is Elohim, which is another word for God. You made him a little lower than you, God, and you, you, you crowned him with loving kindness and tender mercies. And so we, we talked about that. And then also we mentioned Psalms 103. Oh, pardon me. I had y'all in Romans, don't I? Romans chapter 2, uh, two verse 4. It says, uh, Or uh, despiseth thou the riches of his goodness and the forbearance and long and forbearance and long sufferings, uh, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. And so God doesn't want you getting saved because you heard about fire insurance. God wants you getting saved because you believe the goodness of God. And this is what it says. It says in that same passage, don't despise the riches of his goodness. God wants to be good toward you. And then the forbear, his forbearance and long suffering. Yes, yes, he doesn't want you uh, going against him. And yes, he doesn't want you uh, messing up and, and contradicting him. But he's forbearing and he's long suffering because he just wants you to come back so he can love on you and so you can begin to walk out his plan that he predestined for you to walk out, okay? All right, and so to the goodness of God leads men to repentance. And this is a verse that you and I, we've got to have as a part of our daily lives. Psalms 103, one through seven. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits. So God is a God of benefits, and it, it goes into showing his benefits. He forgives our iniquities, he heals, all of our diseases, you say, well, I know so-and-so that had a disease and, and, and they weren't healed. Listen, healing, and we're going to talk about being redeemed from sickness. Healing, the, the price of healing was paid for 
on the on the stripes of Jesus, listen, before the cross. So during Easter weekend or, or whatever, when Jesus got the stripes, uh, two places in the Bible, 1 Peter 2, 24 and Isaiah 53, talks about the our healing was placed on Jesus by those stripes. And so, so again, it's already paid for, just like salvation. All we have to do is believe and receive what Jesus already paid for. You know, Jesus, whenever a person gets saved today, I believe people are going to get saved watching this. And then whenever they watch it, you know, on, on YouTube or whatever. But, but Jesus doesn't crawl back on the cross again every time a person gets saved. They just, by faith, believe what was done 2,000 plus years ago, and they receive it right then. And boom, first they're born again, brand new. Well, it's the same thing with healing. It's the same thing with, and with financial blessings as well. All right, so uh, he, he forgives all of our sins, heals all our diseases. He redeems our life from destruction. He crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies who satisfies our mouth with good things so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. All right, so it's important to recognize that. Now, look at, uh, or you can write this down, write this down, write down Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Hebrews 11, verse 6. Because you, you got to start recognizing God is a gift giver and God is a rewarder. This is uh, Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. What pleases God? Oh, well, you know, go to church, please God, pray, please God. All these things, people, listen, I'm telling you, well, first, following God pleases God. But if you have faith in what he said, you'll do all those things. Faith pleases God. So if you're doing what the Bible says to do, what God said his word to do, then you have faith to do it. And so if you have faith to do it, then you're pleasing God. And so it's not necessarily all the doo-doos, all the do that sounds bad, all, the, all those things that you do, it's are you doing it in faith? Because, you know, I've seen people give, not giving in faith. They do it out of duty. <laughs> Great. All right, let me just rewind. All right. All right. You know we were going to go there. I'm sorry. All right. So, back to this right here. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and listen to this, and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. God wants to reward you. So, we saw that God gives gifts. Uh, you can write this down. Write this down, Matthew chapter 7, verses 9 uh, through 11. Um, it says, Or what man is there of you who, if his son asks bread, this is Matthew 7, verses 9 and 11, 9 through 11, or what man is it there of you whom, if God, or it, pardon me, whom, if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a, a serpent? If, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more? Okay, right where you are, I want you to say more. Oh, I see, we got to hear too. All right. If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Your good, good father is looking for the opportunity to lavish his love on you. That's what a good, good father does. Now, let's, what is the difference between a gift and a reward? A gift is given out of an act of love and an act of grace. So in other words, a gift, a gift is given because of what somebody else did. Not me, not what I did, but what they did. See, the gift of salvation was based on what Jesus did. I just have faith to believe what was done by grace. And so gifts are an act of love and grace, not based, not based on the actions of the receiver. Uh, gifts are the act of love and grace and not on the actions of the receiver. So in other words, it's what somebody else did for me regardless of, of anything I've done for myself. Now, a reward is different. A reward is given for what you have done. A reward is given for a merit or for an achievement. So are you seeing the difference? God is a rewarder for you for, for you believing Him, for having faith, but then He gives gifts because He loves you and He wants to grace you. So we got to make sure we understand there's a difference between those two because you can't work for salvation, and once you get saved, you can't work to keep it. All right? And so, but if you really believe God, if, you, if you're saved and you believe God, you're going to do things because you know God will reward you in the first place. Are you seeing that? God is good. He's a good God. 
How about this? Uh, Y'all know John 3, 16? All right, y'all know that, right? For God so loved the world that he gave. All right, he gave a gift. We didn't deserve that gift. There was no merit on our part, but he graced us and gave us the free gift of salvation for those who believe. All we have to do is believe it. Now, now uh, it's important for us to realize we have a choice in the matter, but again, it's already accomplished. It's already paid for. sitting on a shelf waiting for us to just grab the thing. And so God is a good, good father. Write this down. James chapter 1, verse 17. James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So every good gift, every good gift is from God. Okay? So it's important to see good gifts are from God. God wants to give you good gifts. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs, it uh, says, The blessing of the Lord maketh rich and adds no sorrow with it. So the gifts that God gives doesn't add any sorrow with it. Now the enemy wants to fool us. He tries to, to fool us and, and deceive us and trick us with things that look like a gift. That's why you got to make sure your, your spirit is kicked in and you, can, you discern it. Eh, is that from God or is that from the enemy? Uh, but good things are from God. Good that God gives good things to his children just because he's your good, good father. Just because he's your good father. Um, you know, years ago, my wife and I, uh, we were associate pastors at a church in Dallas, where youth pastors to start with, and uh, we served uh, some phenomenal leaders, uh, Pastor Burt and, and uh, Gene Albritton. Man, they were just phenomenal people, and, and one of the things I remember serving uh, on staff with Pastor Burt Albritton uh, was that, man, the man and his wife, they were always doing things to bless the staff. I mean, it was like you, you couldn't go a week without them showing somehow that they were thinking about the staff. And then uh, their daughter uh, and son-in-law, Sharon, Sharon and Ron Axton, man, they were the same way. They just they were always looking for an opportunity to bless the staff. Well, here's the funny thing. Um, man, there were times where we had projects there at the church. Uh, you know, we were on salary. We weren't paid, well, we weren't paid hourly. Um, but because they just loved us and graced us all the time, man, we didn't work. I didn't work by hours. You know, yes, quitting time was 4 o'clock, but, but man, I want to make sure that, that whatever they were, were working on, I'm going to jump in with them, and I want to help them get things done. If they're going to be there late, I'm going to be there late. Unless they made me leave, I was going to be there late with them. Why? Because I wanted to do things for them. And listen, I wasn't doing it for reward. I wasn't doing it for a pat on the back. But they were just so good to me that I wanted to be a blessing to them. You know, when I think about great leaders, I think about those two couples all the time because they were just like Jesus to me. They were doing good to me, and I just wanted to please them. I just wanted to do good for them. Listen, God is good. Listen to this, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Uh, Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost. Everyone say uttermost. That is a good word. Save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So in other words, Jesus is praying for you. Jesus is praying for you. Jesus prays for us. I'll give you another verse on that. But I want to give you the definition of the word uttermost. Uttermost. Now, now as you're getting ready to write that down, I want you to, I'm going to ask you this. Are you, are you getting a picture of what Jesus, what God, what the Father, what his will is for you and I? He wants to love on us. Man, you know, that was the, the problem in the Garden of Eden when, when Adam and Eve forfeit, they gave away the glory of God. They got rid of it by, the Bible says, I believe in Romans chapter 6, verse 16, it's an important verse for you to recognize. The Bible says that to whom you you choose to obey, you, to serve, to that person you become a slave. So whenever Adam and Eve obeyed Satan there in the garden, they became his slave. Now a slave has no property, no rights. So the dominion, the authority, the right to rulership on the earth that God gave man in Genesis 1.26, that was stolen by Satan. And that's where the Bible in 1 Corinthians, I believe, tells us that Satan is the god of this world. How did that happen? He got that by usurping the authority from Adam and Eve. 
by, by getting them. And so when, when the glory of God was no longer on Adam, God could not reach down and hug and love on Adam because God's power and glory would kill him. It would get, you know, if I was full of electricity, and I, I was still alive, and, and my son, he was full of electricity, so, you know, we have the same DNA, and I can hug him, and I'm not going to electrocute him, okay? I can love on him, and, and I, got, I got sweet kids, man. They, I love to love on my kids, and so they love to love on me. And so, if I were to reach down and grab Max, my electricity, and he's electricity, and we're just, but if something happens, and he is demagnetized and no longer electric, and I were to get my electric self and hug him, I would shock him to death. And so it would hurt me if that were to happen because here I created him. <laughs> yeah, I created my kid. Here I created him to mow the lawn. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I created him to love, to love on, and, and to pass on my legacy. Woohoo! And so uh, I, all that, and that, now I can't hug him? That would, that would crush me. Well, that's what happened to God in the Garden of Eden is God could no longer hug and love on Adam because that glory... The, that glory of God that was covering Adam was no longer there. And so here now, Jesus, that's what Jesus did. He restored that so he can, so God can love on you and I again. And that's just that's just wow stuff. I mean, for me, that doesn't that doesn't mean, oh yeah, that's for me, I'm not thinking, oh man, that means if I just keep I can live for I can get all the goodness of God, keep on sinning. I don't want to do evil stuff. Because now I'm not perfect, so I make mistakes. But but just like David, a man after God's own heart, who if he did mess up, he just turned around and repented right away and get right back in the position with God. And God is faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. But what I want to show you this morning is how good God is, and that He redeemed you and I so that He can love you and I and lavish you with His love. I know religion doesn't say that, but religion for hundreds of years, if not thousands, was created to control, to control people. You look at nations that were controlled by, by one dominant church in a, in a nation, and then politics connected with those religious authorities, and they ruled nations by re the religious whip, basically. That's not what God wanted. God wanted love. He wanted a love relationship with you and I. So the word uttermost, God is able to save the uttermost. The word uttermost in the original Greek means complete, whole, and entire. God wants to save you completely, wholly, and entirely. Are, are you seeing that? Listen, relationship has benefits. There is benefits to relationship. All right, look at Luke 22, verse 31, and we'll, we'll get ready to close with this. Luke 22, starting in verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. Now I want you to recognize this. We are actually here today. There's some, I'll share this with you. But uh, Jesus is telling Peter, Peter, Buddy, you're going to screw up. But, but listen, I, I prayed for you, and you'll get all right, but here's what I need you to do when you're, when you're back. Here's what I need you to do when you're all fixed up, when you get your head back together, your life back. Here's what I need you to do. See, so in other words, Jesus wasn't focusing on Peter's screw-up or his sin. He was, his focus was on what I need you to do when you get past yourself. You know, when in the Great Commission, we see the word go, the word G-O. The word go in the original Greek, when you study that out, it literally means get past self. Get past yourself. Well, I'm too shy. I can't witness to somebody. Get past you. Get over yourself. Well, you know, I'm in quarantine. I can't really do anything for Jesus. You better get over yourself. Well, I, I can't really do it. Oh, anyway. All right. So it says here, or you see here, that, that Jesus said, Peter, you're going to mess up. You'll make mistakes. But I prayed for you that your faith fail not. But I need you to do something. Uh, about four weeks ago, or three weeks ago now, uh, during, during my, my prayer time with the Lord, the Lord impressed on me a, a, a couple things. One of the things he impressed on my spirit to do was go back and look at the prophecies that uh, we read here at the church on the first Sunday of the year. And, and I'll get you a copy of those if you want them. Um, some from uh, trusted prophets that we are associated with and we're connected to by covenant. 
and uh, and read those. So I started reading those, and and as I'm going through those, I recognize there was nothing about about a virus or any of that destruction, all that nothing about that in the verse. In, pardon me, in the in the prophecies. Okay, and uh, and as I recognized that, one of the things the Lord impressed in my spirit was this: the, all, God knew all this stuff was going to happen. But it wasn't the dominant thing on his mind because he's already given it. He's already done something about it. He's done something about the virus. He's done something about everything that's already happened or going to happen. But what's on his mind, because he already got his covenant in place to take care of it. So the covenant is how you take care of this. That's how you take care of it. It's the covenant. That's how you take care I'll say that again. That's how you take care of it through the covenant. So if he's already given us the covenant, why, is that on, why would a virus be on his mind? But what was on his mind was everything he said in the prophecies, the orders, the commands, the assignment for the year 2020. That's what's still on the mind of God. And so this morning, what's on God's mind for you is not your goof-ups or my goof-ups or my mess-ups. What's on God's mind is I need them to get straight real quick so I can love on them. God is looking for the opportunity to love on you. I'll close with this. Um, I heard a story one time about a uh, about a shepherd, uh, and this shepherd was well well known. Um, everyone heard of the shepherd. Uh, a lot of folk never saw the shepherd. They just heard all these stories, and they thought it was almost legend. But all of a sudden, they heard song and dance, and they're looking and they, they thought, what is all that celebration music, that parade music? And and so someone came running. Hey, it's that good good shepherd. It's the good shepherd. Who, who takes care of his flock and, and uh, the shepherd everyone talks about. He's a great shepherd. And so, so you know, somebody was standing there watching. Well, I've got to see this shepherd. And so here comes the shepherd, and, and the shepherd was coming. The shepherd looks good. I mean, the shepherd is strong. He's healthy, and, and he, he's got good clothes on. He looks great, you know, and he, and he just, you know, he's just excellent shape, and he looks phenomenal. I mean, he's dressed wonderful, and he's got good shoes on, and the shepherd comes by, and then all the shepherd's sheep are following him, and the sheep look tattered. They got bald spots. Uh, they got their they're limping. They got you know four sheep, you know four legged sheep are hobbling, hobbling on on uh, on three legs. Friend, friend of mine has this little chihuahua. It's the funniest thing because when the chihuahua runs across our driveway, because they'll come over, you know. And and uh, did I say that last? Okay, I didn't say the name. All right. Anyway, so uh, so you know we're trying to protect those who are our uh, our quarantine friends. And so anyway, this chihuahua, when it gets on the concrete, it lifts up its rear leg. One leg, it's like, it's running across, it keeps its leg, it's, it is the goofiest but funniest thing. All right, anyhow. But, so these sheep are coming, and, and it's all, you know, and they look really, really bad, and lost some teeth, and one's got a swollen eye, got his eye funk coming out of his eye, and the other one's just dri dripping, and, and, but the shepherd looks good. And the people said, when this guy watching the sheep, said, man, alive. That's a good shepherd. I don't want to have nothing to do with that shepherd. Do you know there are people that have been presented a wrong shepherd? They presented a sheep that cares for himself and not for his sheep. But I'm here to tell you right now that the good shepherd wants to care for you. He wants to lavish you in his love. He wants to bless your life. He wants to heal you. But you see, you have to be open to his word for what's already in his word. Because the Bible says that he's already given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. This morning, I'm going to ask you, have you made the good shepherd your shepherd? Maybe you've heard about a shepherd, but you saw the sheep, and you realize those sheep are broke, busted, disgusted. I don't want nothing to do with that shepherd. That's the way his sheep look like? Well, you've seen the wrong shepherd. You've heard of the wrong shepherd. Because our good shepherd is a good shepherd. How do I know? Well, uh, the, the, the first thing is, is that I've experienced him myself. I've experienced him. I've seen healing in my body. No, listen, I've seen healing and I've seen miracles. What is the difference? Miracles are instant. Healing is progressive by faith in the Word of God. I have, uh, I, I, that's going on, by healing. But what I'm saying is the good shepherd wants to lead you, but you have to give yourself to be a sheep. To that good shepherd. It's very, very easy. And so I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads right where you are and pray this prayer after me. Father, in Jesus' name, I recognize there's a real good shepherd. 
who loves his sheep, who wants to care for his sheep better, better than any other shepherd around. So bless the sheep, lavish the sheep, heal his sheep, prosper his sheep, give peace to his sheep. That's the shepherd I want to lead my life. I recognize Jesus is that shepherd. He died on the cross and rose on the third day to become my shepherd. I repent of my sin. I receive your forgiveness. Come into my life. Now I know you're there. And from this day forward, I receive Jesus to be my good shepherd. In Jesus' name. Now I know there's many of you who have, have, have prayed that prayer before and Jesus is your shepherd, but maybe you have not seen this scriptural side of the Good Shepherd. Well, it's time that we did. Now, I want you to take those scriptures that I read, maybe watch this video one more time, take the scriptures that I read, and I don't want you to believe me. I want you to believe the Word of God. You see, we've been taught wrong in a lot of areas, and we've got to make sure that we've got the right shepherd. You have been redeemed to become a son and daughter of the Most High God, so he can pour out his love on you. Amen. I love you and be blessed.